Right, is the, I, I hope the YouTube um, streaming has started and uh, we are recording this. Um, yeah, streaming started. So, so everybody, I mean, I, I can see quite a lot of people have already uh, logged in. Uh, we are uh, hitting about a hundred. Welcome everybody to the Thursday um, colloquium, Ayuka. This has been quite a successful series so far in terms of both the kinds of um, uh, topics we have covered in uh, moving this uh, 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 normal, uh, Thursday, uh, four o'clock Korokiam on to Zoom, as well as the response we've got from uh, from people, uh, not just all over India, but uh, many people from all over the world. Um, last week, we had uh, Professor Phil Charles and I said how, um, you know, I met him first as my teacher in Oxford. Today, I'm so happy to welcome uh, Professor Shubhi Sharkar from the University of Oxford. Actually, I met him first around the same time uh, when I went as an undergraduate. Prashant Shah is here, I can see we were both um, at Oxford at the same time, and uh, Dr. Shubhi Sharkar was a postdoc then, uh, uh, with uh, working with Professor Dennis Sharma. Uh, before that, of course, he did his PhD from uh, TIFR, which is why a lot of my colleagues know uh, know him from that time uh, when he worked with uh, Professor Ramnath Kausik in, uh, in TIFR, and then um, then he moved over to uh, various uh, uh, positions in, in CERN. Uh, in um, in um, and, and and ended up in Oxford, but one of the uh, the crucial things that a lot of people don't know about Professor Sharkar is that in the in between these uh, these uh, hardcore academic posts, he had a wonderful time in which he spent some time working in science education with Ekalavya in Madhya Pradesh in Central India at a time when he actually worked on um, with uh, rural children and uh, primary school education and things like that, both he and his wife spent quite a lot of time uh, working uh, in, in, in science education, which I, this is a very, very uh, wonderful uh, interlude that not many people have. Of course, uh, then he uh, came back in the early 90s to um, astrophysics research and, uh, um, and then settled in, in University of Oxford and uh, uh, partly at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Um, of late in his various visiting positions, um, he's been all around the world, but he had um, a, a stint at the Niels Bohr Institute as Niels Bohr professor in Copenhagen uh, for several years. Um, and um, and uh, one of the things that he's done, he's gone back to his supernovae, um, which was his early love uh, during his, um, in, uh, it, it, his PhD work, but uh, taken up um, um, this, this uh, wonderful position against, uh, um, I would say, um, uh, the paradigm, uh, the dark energy paradigm right now in questioning the various assumptions that have been made uh, in, um, in, in uh, coming to this conclusion of the dark energy being uh, one of the major components of the universe. And we really look forward to his view on um, um, the evidence of an isotropy in, in cosmology. Uh, Professor Shubhi Shark, to you. Thanks, Dr. Shamok. Thanks, Kandu. Well, uh, really pleasure to speak to this audience. And uh, uh, I must also thank all the people who have connected. Uh, I realize that uh, it's not as uh, immediate an experience as being in the same room where you can interrupt me as I speak. So I'll have the advantage of uh, talking for a whole hour uh, and take questions at the end. So uh, the subject today is the what we call the Hubble expansion. And this itself is a misnomer. As uh, many of you know, Hubble never actually talked about the expanding universe. Uh, in fact, perhaps uh, not so many know that he was actually at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. I don't know if you know this, but he didn't study astronomy. He studied law because that's what his father wanted him to become. Yeah. And uh, he interpreted this uh, correlation between redshift and distance uh, as due to the so-called de -sitter effect, which is a dilation of time intervals in a metric that de -sitter had written down that looked static, but actually was de -sitter space, accelerating uh, space-time. And uh, the prediction was that the redshift should go as the square of the distance, and Hubble initially tried to fit the data to that relationship as did many other prominent astronomers of his time. And then Desider realized that his space time did not actually admit any inertial observers uh, and that the relationship should always be proportional. Uh, 
simply from uh, the basic symmetries of the space time. And at this point, Hubble uh, was very embarrassed and he wrote to De Sitter, this was two years later, the interpretation of the data we feel should be left to you and the very few others who are competent to discuss the matter with authority. So you can see the language of a lawyer <laughs> coming in there. But I think this is important to keep in mind that uh, observing is one thing, interpreting is another. And the history of cosmology started with an interpretation that in fact was incorrect. And uh, Hubble was a great cosmologist. He understood the importance of separating these two issues, but I'm afraid we are still using the same model of cosmology that was being constructed then a hundred years ago. And uh, sometimes people uh, go to rather literal interpretation of the data. And I shall try to argue that it is in this manner that you have been led to this fantastic universe, which we now call the standard model of cosmology. Okay, so obviously there has been a lot of progress on the observational front since then, if not theoretically. So that entire range of velocities and distances that Hubble uh, plotted there is just the little dot in the corner in that plot in 2001. And uh, a few years uh, ago, for the first time, this entire data set was made publicly available by the joint light curve analysis group, which included most of the supernova astronomers in the world. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is our recent analysis of last year in which we show that the inferred uh, deceleration parameter uh, or uh, with a minus sign, the acceleration parameter is in fact uh, not isotropic, but a dipole as is indicated in the plot on the right hand side here. And the uh, peak is actually pretty close to the direction uh, in which we see a dipole in the cosmic microwave background. Now, Let's step back to uh, take a, a, you know, have an overview on the uh, context in which you do cosmology. So the first thing to recognize is that we have a very particular view on the universe from our uh, position, and we only observe what is along our past light cone. So there are always going to be fundamental limits in cosmology as uh, people like George Ellis have emphasized for many years. And uh, these limits are uh, set simply by the fact that uh, today in modern language, you'd say we live in some fluctuating density field and there is going to be cosmic variance. There are going to be fluctuations in the quantities you measure depending on our location, uh, depending on the directions we look at, uh, uh, perhaps uh, even depending on the volumes that you average over. So keeping this in mind, we therefore need a physical principle in order to be able to uh, construct a science which is valid for everyone. And that physical principle will come to in a minute, the cosmological principle, but that basically states that the universe is uh, isotropic and homogeneous. So all observers are equivalent. And this means that we can construct uh, a metric for space time, which is maximally symmetric, uh, that's the Robertson-Walker metric. We all know it. I've written it here in a form that is suggestive of a Minkowski metric by choosing to use conformal time rather than ordinary time. Uh, but what that enables me to do is to map the entire universe into this little circle here, where if you will like, we are uh, on at the North Pole of a hypersphere. The antipodal point is the Big Bang and light is constrained to come to us just along the surface of the sphere. So uh, as we go out radially, we are uh, going out in uh, conformal time or redshift, if you like, which is marked here. And uh, the infinite redshift surface is the south pole of this hypersphere. And uh, as you know, uh, the universe is opaque beyond a redshift of a thousand because it is then ionized and we only observe uh, objects within uh, a redshift of a few at the moment. And the furthest we can observe in photons is about a thousand. Maybe one day we'll look back much, much further with gravitational waves. Now this metric uh, gives you the space time. We have to populate it with, with, with matter. And that is described by the energy momentum tensor in Einstein's equations. 
And uh, because of this assumed isotropy and homogeneity, this complicated set of 10 equations simplifies to just one, which is the Hubble equation. And in the Hubble equation, we have uh, matter, which is modeled as an ideal fluid. We have the curvature of space-like sections, and we have a cosmological constant, lambda. Now, lambda enters uh, because of the assumed uh, well, local coordinate uh, invariance, uh, symmetry of this equation, which allows you to add any term proportional to the metric. And subsequently, uh, when people realize that the energy momentum tensor on the right-hand side uh, is not just a classical ideal gas, it could also be a field theory. This was first recognized by people like Pauli and Zeldovich. Uh, they realized that the energy momentum tensor uh, also contains what in modern field theory language we would call a super renormalizable term, a cosmological constant of its own, uh, which corresponds to the vacuum fluctuations, the ground state fluctuations of all the fields. And the total lambda therefore is the sum of this bare lambda on the left, the geometric part, and the part that is being contributed by the fields. And it is this sum that affects cosmological evolution. So you know all this. And you know that therefore we can write this uh, suggestively in terms of the uh, ratios of uh, the energy densities of matter and the curvature and the cosmological constant to the critical density, this 3h squared by 8 pi g. And when we write it in this way, uh, we see that the matter energy density, of course, uh, it gets diluted with the expansion as the volume. So that's one plus z cube. The curvature falls off as the square, but lambda remains constant. And uh, at the present epoch, we therefore have this so-called cosmic sum rule, which just says that we have allowed three components, therefore they should add up to one. And uh, this is an old story now gone on for more than 20 years that we observe uh, this quantity of roughly omega matter minus omega lambda uh, by looking at the Hubble diagram of supernovae. And we also measured this curvature to be quite close to zero from the position of the first acoustic peak in the cosmic microwave background fluctuations. And we make estimates of the matter density, which are rather approximate, but all seem to be uh, much smaller than one. And therefore we infer that the missing term, which makes it all add up to one, uh, namely lambda, uh, is of order 0.7. And since omega lambda is defined as lambda over 3h naught square, this means that lambda is of order h naught square. Right? And this is the standard model of cosmology. And uh, it is striking that the scale of lambda is set by construction, by the only parameter in this model which has got dimensions, which is the present day Hubble parameter. And for particle physicists, uh, this is 10 to the minus 42 g. That's roughly the uh, Hubble radius, 10 to the 28 centimeters. It's an infrared scale. It has nothing to do with fundamental physics. Of course, it has everything to do with observations because the Hubble parameter enters into every observation that we make. And so uh, just looking at this, one is struck by the fact that we are interpreting data in a model that requires lambda to get a value of order h naught square, and that this is kind of forced on the uh, object by construction. But of course, if you want to drive accelerated expansion as the supernova Hubble diagram supposedly tells us, then you need the pressure to be negative from the second equation. And this uh, it naturally then is interpreted as due to vacuum energy, except that the scale of this vacuum energy is the geometric mean of 10 to the minus 42 GeV and the Planck scale, which is eight by G. And that turns out to be of order uh, uh, in electron volt, milli electron volt, 10 to the minus 12 GeV. And this, of course, is the uh, notorious cosmological constant problem, which is that we don't understand why lambda should be set at a scale which is much smaller than any fundamental scale in field theory, for example, the scale of electric interactions. Uh, we don't even need to go up to the Planck scale. That already is a discrepancy of 60 orders of magnitude. So let me uh, very briefly, since you know, at a rough estimate, about 10,000 papers have been written on the subject, uh, discuss the so-called coincidence problem, which is that 
omega lambda is of order omega matter today, as we just discussed. And why is this? Because one is changing as z cube and the other is constant. So therefore, there is a coincidence. Now, actually, uh, as, I, as we just discussed, it is not really a coincidence. It is by construction. But nevertheless, we can ask whether we can have some dynamical understanding of this. And you can indeed do that by considering lambda to be the vacuum energy of some uh, scalar field. Uh, and you give it a nice name, quintessence. And it has to have a height of the order of the inferred vacuum energy density, which is 10 to the minus 12 GeV. But in order for this field to be slowed down by the Hubble expansion so that it can track the matter energy density, and there is a fixed point in the equations that is what's attractive about quintessence. In order to do that, the curvature of this field, the mass term, has to be also of order the Hubble parameter. So you have to put in the Hubble parameter by hand. Therefore, there is nothing natural about quintessence. It is just as fine-tuned as a bare cosmological constant. And uh, there are obviously formidable difficulties in trying to construct a, a field which has got this kind of a hierarchy between its mass and its vacuum expectation value. And you could make the same comment about all the attempts to modify gravity. For example, uh, the so-called uh, 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 DGP brain world which uh, has to do with, sorry, it's Dwali Gabadzad de Purati, brain world, which uh, supposes that uh, gravity can propagate in another dimension on a sufficiently large scale. But the only scale in gravity is the Planck scale. So in order for this to be relevant to cosmology, you have to suppose that rather than uh, funny things happening at the Planck scale, they actually happen on the scale of the present Hubble radius. So again, you are putting in H0 by hand. So to cut a long story short, this is true of every proposal that has been made to address this cosmological constant problem. Uh, massive gravity is a recent one. You can indeed construct a, a ghost-free theory of gravity with a massive graviton. Uh, but in order for it to be cosmologically relevant, you have to give the graviton a mass of the order of the present-day Hubble parameter. So uh, it's the same fine tuning and all of them, and some of them are uh, you know, doubly ugly. So of course, uh, if lambda was always of order h squared rather than h naught squared, then this problem would not be there. But that uh, is uh, trivially seen to be, uh, you know, not even wrong because that is just renormalization of g. Because you can always take lambda to the left hand side, and so then that just corresponds to h squared times one minus one third, and uh, then you just change g, and that's not only phenomenologically not valid. Uh, it's also uh, not going to give you accelerated expansion. So uh, this is just to conclude that notwithstanding those thousands of papers, there's just no point in trying to understand uh, this from a, a dynamical point of view, because uh, this scale of the present day Hubble parameter has to be put in by hand. So, uh, you know, I think one should always declare one's prejudice I'm fundamentally prejudiced as a theorist against the idea that lambda can be of order h naught square because I don't see that it can make any physical sense. However, that is what uh, astronomy has told us is the case. And uh, we have arrived at this universe with, uh, you know, at least two thirds of it is so called dark energy. And uh, we have to keep in mind that this important conclusion is arrived at with the assumption that the universe can be described as isotropic and homogeneous. This was a starting point. And so we have all this huge amount of beautiful data coming in from all these satellites and telescopes. But in fact, the foundational assumptions of the standard cosmological model have not really been looked at as much as uh, one would have liked to have seen. Because it still rests on this so-called principle I mean, a real physical uh, subject should not have principles. It should be based on empirical data. And uh, cosmology, because of the point that I made earlier, that we are confined to one location in space-time, um, we move in time, of course, but not in space. We have to have this cosmological principle, which was propounded by Edward Milne, who was, in fact, uh, a professor of mathematics here. And he... Uh, essentially uh, made it a principle, something that had already been taken into account uh, 
uh, in constructing the first cosmological models. Uh, some of you will know that there was a further development where the cosmological principle became the perfect cosmological principle in which we don't occupy a special place in time either. And that led to the steady state theory of oil and Nalikar and Bondi and gold and so on. And that theory uh, was ultimately uh, discounted when uh, the Kobe satellite flew and revealed the uh, microwave background to have a near perfect black body form, because in the steady state theory, you would have had to have generated it from recycling starlight. And uh, to do that to such precision would be difficult without obscuring the uh, extragalactic universe. So uh, we have abandoned the perfect cosmological principle, but we are still uh, got on board the cosmological principle. Now, what is the evidence for isotropy and homogeneity? Well, the first thing everyone does is turn to Wikipedia and it tells me that the universe is highly isotropic and it shows this picture from Planck and the power spectrum of these fluctuations we all know is uh, statistically isotropic, we are told it's approximately Gaussian random field, at least no non-Gaussian entities have been identified. And therefore you can quantify it just by the two point correlations, which gives you this uh, beautiful fit of the data to the standard cosmological model, uh, very persuasive. And with that spectrum of fluctuations, you can use uh, linear perturbation theory in gravity to understand how the structure in the universe today came to uh, form from the fluctuations that we see imprinted on the microwave background at last scattering. And this growth is purely through gravity. We don't need to have uh, any other phenomenon. For example, at one point people considered explosions uh, and uh, that is not necessary. Uh, gravity does it. Only, of course, if you have dark matter because the fluctuations have to start growing about a factor of 10 uh, in uh, redshift before recombination in order to grow to their present size today. So this actually is the strongest evidence I know of for, uh, well, the strongest requirement for dark matter. Now, this is a success story that we have this picture of how structure came to be, although we don't know where those fluctuations came from. Uh, we call it inflation, but we don't really have a physical theory for it. Nevertheless, I think it's a very, very impressive uh, uh, story that we can do a first principles calculation and match it to a wealth of data today uh, through this uh, cartoon. But in fact, when you look at it more closely, the CMB sky is not actually uh, as isotropic as the Wikipedia picture makes you think. There is actually a much bigger anisotropy in the form of a dipole, which was of course discovered earlier because uh, it's much bigger than those little fluctuations. And the dipole pattern is pretty well fitted by the formula that you can ask your, uh, in your special radiativity class to derive as the temperature that a inertial observer who's boosted with the velocity beta would see uh, if they are going through a, a, plank, a black body spectrum of radiation. So we interpret this as due to our motion. And because delta T by T is 10 to the minus three, our beta is also 10 to the minus three. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, in a direction which is roughly opposite to the direction that we are orbiting around the center of our galaxy. So if you add the two vectors together, the motion that we have is actually closer to 620 kilometers a second. And in fact, it seems to be shared by the local group of galaxies towards some direction. Now, Obviously, if the universe was exactly homogeneous, then we should not be moving. We should see the uh, microwave background as isotropic. So we understand this as due to local inhomogeneity. Of course, there are fluctuations. It's not uh, homogeneous on all scales, only when averaged over some uh, scale. And that scale, uh, all the textbooks will tell you is of order 100 megaparsecs. And therefore, uh, averaged over 100 megaparsecs, this, uh, we can see local motions and they should disappear on scales larger than that. Now, the only way to determine homogeneity uh, uh, empirically is by counting galaxies. And this was actually proposed by people in condensed matter physics uh, because uh, the robust way is to just determine 
how the counts of galaxies scale with increasing distance from us. So uh, on small scales, in fact, they, uh, the number of galaxies scales as R squared because uh, the fractal dimension is close to two. Uh, galaxies are on sheets and not distributed in a volume. But it is claimed when do this exercise in something like the Wiggle Z survey, which was done from Australia, that the fractal dimension, as you see in these plots, apparently does go to three at a scale of order uh, 100 megaparsecs. And uh, uh, therefore, apparently, the universe is homogeneous on those scales. Um, of course, if you know about the Wiggle Z survey, you might wonder how is it that they were able to contain spheres as large as 100 or bigger megaparsecs within the survey volume, which had a rather odd shape. And it turns out that they didn't. The spheres actually went outside the volume and they filled them with galaxies from a model simulation. Uh, so, you know, this is uh, just one example of many I'll describe where people have uh, blurred the line between, uh, you know, what you're trying to find out and what you think the answer is. Uh, uh, to arrive at a, a not totally robust conclusion. What our universe actually looks like is this. This is a, a picture. This is, I mean, you can have a better uh, picture, of course, today from the detailed studies that are carried out, and I'll show you that for a second. The Lanarkia cluster, uh, supercluster that has been mapped out by Brent Tully and collaborators. But in fact, for our purposes, it is simpler to look at this picture where I have marked out uh, a 100 megaparsec volume centered on us, just to indicate on what scale the universe is supposedly homogeneous. Uh, now, of course, one must keep in mind that this is a picture of the visible matter and what is really relevant for the homogeneity question is the dark matter, uh, which might be more smoothly distributed, uh, although on these scales, the bias factor is supposed to be of order one. Nevertheless, uh, we are at the center here and we are supposed to be moving in this roughly in this direction uh, in order to explain the dipole in the cosmic microwave background. And if that is so, then the clear expectation is that if I increase the scale of the averaging that I'm doing, then this velocity should fall off roughly as one over R and we should converge to the so-called CMB frame uh, when we go to a little larger scale. Uh, we haven't done it on 100 megaparsecs, but maybe uh, it's a little bigger than that. Now, the theory of peculiar velocity fields is uh, quite straightforward. I'll just uh, put up one or two equations uh, just to show you how straightforward it is. I mean, this is all Newtonian. We are talking about scales where general relativistic effects are not uh, important. And uh, we therefore ask, how uh, one would react to a density perturbation, which is some fluctuation over the average density. And we just use the usual Poisson's equation. Now, the important point to notice is that uh, because this uh, growth is self-similar, the potential and its gradient and the direction of the acceleration and integral, all of them uh, are unchanged. So there is no vorticity in this problem. So the peculiar velocity field, therefore, is just given by Newton's law. You integrate uh, over the Newton force law. And uh, the peculiar Hubble flow, which is just the trace of the shear tensor for the experts, is just the difference between the actual Hubble flow and this idealized average flow uh, of H0, which uh, uh, holds for the assumed underlying Friedman-Robertson-Walker model. So the fluctuations can therefore be measured by, uh, in practical terms, you have to always use some kind of a window function. You are averaging over some scale, and uh, that would depend on what kind of a survey you are doing. So for a volume-limited survey, you would have a something like a step function like that. And then when we start working in Fourier coordinates, that would have a corresponding uh, 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 kernel. So the Fourier transform of that, uh, just looks like this, where delta is now the density contrast. And the fluctuations in the Hubble parameter from point to point will be given in terms of an integral over the fluctuation spectrum. And this is just the window function that corresponds to that top hat that I just showed. And this delta sub h is now the variance in the fluctuations of the Hubble parameter. And we can compute it if you tell me what the power spectrum of matter fluctuations is, which I can infer from um, uh, two-point correlation function of galaxies, uh, 
which have been measured. And I know the rate of growth of these fluctuations under gravity. Uh, this is general relativity here. And if I put all that together and I compute this variance as a function of the averaging scale, I get a shape like that. So as expected, the fluctuations fall off rather steeply. They're of order about 1% at a scale of a something like 100 H inverse megaparsecs, but they'll keep falling. And therefore, if you go to larger and larger scales, the fluctuation should disappear and you should not expect a significant variance. So this is for an ideal universe. Uh, and I have assumed here a, a, power, a matter power spectrum, which is approximated by a power law. But in fact, it is hardly sensitive to the matter power spectrum. Even if I put a huge bump in the matter power spectrum, because I'm averaging it over all wave numbers, it gets smoothed out and you don't get much of a shift in that. And therefore, if I calculate the peculiar velocity, which is a similar integral, then I again infer that the peculiar velocity, which is here in units of 100 kilometers per second, uh, should be of order to 300 kilometers per second uh, on the 100 megaparsec scale, but it should fall off as one over R, as I said earlier. And by the time we reach some scale like 300 megaparsec, the peculiar velocity should have fallen below 100 kilometers per second. So I'm showing all this in order to illustrate that this is a standard calculation uh, that you know, has been done many times, and we are all agreed on this. So this is a clear prediction uh, of the model that we call the standard model of cosmology. Now, is that really the case? So to test this, uh, we looked at the data. This was about nine years ago. This was with my collaborators, Jacques Collin and Roya Mohai, who are at the Institute of Astrophysics in Paris. Uh, uh, Jacques Collin uh, is a proper card-carrying astronomer, uh, and uh, Roya is a general relativist, and uh, Arman Shafilu, who in fact did his PhD at Ayuka with Varun uh, Sahani and Tarun Sarudip, uh, he worked with us on this. And he in fact developed a rather nice way to look for anisotropies in the distribution of supernovae, which at the time the biggest catalog was the Union 2 catalog. And what we show here are uh, the supernovae in this catalog and the red spots represent those for which the distance modulus is bigger than the value that you expect uh, in an isotropic universe. And the green spots are those for which the modulus is less than the value that you expect. So I say here lambda CDM, but actually on these scales, uh, this lambda is irrelevant because you know, the expansion is uh, not determined by lambda at all. But this is just the standard model of cosmology. So what we found was that if we divide the volume into shells and we look for the pattern in each shell as a function of redshift, we are effectively doing tomography of the Hubble flow and we are testing if the supernovae are actually at the expected distances. So any residual will tell us about the peculiar flow. And the advantage of doing this study is that uh, we are not therefore subject to this uncertainty of the bias between the dark matter and the visible matter, because the velocity of course is a dynamical response to uh, gravity. So nature is effectively doing all the work for us and uh, the velocities that we measure are the net result of whatever is going on. So using the nice tool Arman had developed, which was a ratio of ratios and all the systematics canceled out, in spite of the fact that these supernovae are not uh, uniformly distributed over the sky. Uh, we found that there is a dipole in the uh, supernovae, and that is uh, roughly in the same direction as the CMB dipole, which is shown here as a black dot. Our dipole is the blue dot, but the uncertainty is rather large because, of course, the data sample is pretty sparse. But when we extract the bulk velocity from this, we find that it does not fall off as is expected in the standard model, which is this line here. It stays roughly constant at around 250 to 300 kilometers per second, albeit with huge error bars, all the way out to the extent of the shapely supercluster, which is about 260 megaparsecs. This was the last data point because the data runs out there. Now, you would argue that all these data points are consistent with the standard model because you know, within one, one and a half sigma, 
uh, it's nothing to shout about. However, they're all on one side. They're not scattered about it. And there had been previous uh, observations by uh, Mike Hudson, Watkins, and others who had found a high bulk flow, which was also inconsistent with the standard expectation. And in fact, uh, it had already been known amongst the astronomers who do peculiar velocity surveys that there is no convergence to the CMP frame, even beyond the scale of homogeneity. We just pushed that scale to 300 megaparsecs. Our work was soon confirmed by an independent uh, collaboration led by Saul Perlmutter, the nearby supernova factory. And they uh, used, in fact, uh, both our estimator as well as one they developed themselves to establish that there was a bulk flow in the direction of the CMB dipole, which was discrepant. In fact, uh, their data uh, also ran out at about Z of 0.26 but they had added some new supernovae uh, in that redshift range. And you, this nice picture actually shows you uh, this, what I meant earlier about tomography, uh, the shells of uh, galaxies in which you are looking for a departure from the uniform expansion that is expected. Now, these guys interpreted this in terms of a single attractor, which would be necessary to account for this velocity. So if you just model it simple-minded form like this, then in fact, it turns out that the mass that you need in order to account for the observed velocity at that distance is something like 10 to the 17 solar masses. So that's like another Lanarkia supercluster, right? Of course, nobody has seen it. And this is the puzzle that we see these flows extending much deeper than the scale at which the universe is supposedly homogeneous and nobody sees these objects, and yet the velocities are there. The most recent uh, confirmation of this has come from the largest peculiar velocity survey done to date, which is the six degree field galaxy survey done from the Anglo-Australian telescope. And uh, of course you need independent distance measurements to uh, make this uh, uh, to, for these studies. And that is the, obviously the uh, sort of uh, tricky point because uh, uh, they are not very precise. So you can use Tully Fisher, you can use fundamental plane as was done here, but that's only good to about 15% uh, that has been established by calibrating it with SDSS data. But given the large sum sample and better sky coverage, these people have established a clear discrepancy between uh, the flow that they measure and the lambda CDM expectation which of course depends on what kind of a window you're choosing. The dashed line here is the relevant uh, curve to compare with uh, this red data point. Now, at this point, one can ask the following question. Okay, if we live in a lambda CDM universe, it's a fluctuating density field, and you know, it's just possible that by you know, bad luck or good luck or whatever, you happen to be in a position where you do see a larger than average flow. How likely is that? Well, to answer this question, we interrogated the largest Hubble volume, I mean, the trillion particle Hubble volume simulation, the dark sky simulations that were done out of Stanford. And essentially we can put an upper limit uh, because you're of course at the tail of a very rapidly falling distribution. And we can say confidently that less than 1% of observers who have a neighborhood like ours, Milky Way-like observers, would see a bulk flow that large and extending out that far. So this is to highlight that we are therefore quite certainly not Copernican observers. And the problem is that most of cosmology is uh, done assuming that we are Copernican observers, we are typical observers. And this is the evidence that regardless of what is causing the bulk flow, we are not Copernican observers. And it gets weirder. So a radivist, Christos Sagas in Thessaloniki, who has been working on it for quite some years, has uh, worried about the fact that if we are not Copernican observers, but so-called tilted observers, who are in a bulk flow, and that is indicated by this yellow patch here, and we are uh, not correcting for this when we interpret the data, then we will in fact infer, my may infer, acceleration, whereas the background, the green patch, etc., is actually decelerating because we are not accounting for the fact that we are in a bulk flow which might be diverging or converging 
And according to that, there will be a second term when you try to determine the deceleration parameter that can change its sign. Now, the magnitude of this term is a bit hard to estimate uh, from observations. But the clear expectation is that you should see, therefore, a dipole in the deceleration parameter in the same direction that you are moving. That, that's a clear expectation from this uh, picture. So if that is so, then we should uh, look to see if not just the Hubble parameter, but the second derivative, the deceleration parameter also has a dipole. Now at this point, uh, I can see that I've already taken uh, 45 minutes. So uh, let me speed up a bit. Uh, we have uh, interrogated those simulations that I mentioned earlier to try to determine what sort of a fall off of bulk velocity might one expect in the neighborhood of observers such as ours who have a local universe like environment. And as you can see, these can be quite different from the expectation for typical observers which are bounded by this uh, typical, this uh, blue band this is the typical variance for Newtonian observers, but we are not Newtonian observers. So the covariances that are usually calculated uh, in supernovae analysis, uh, which assume a Newtonian observer, may not be valid because the actual covariances for people like us look like this. They don't look diagonal as is assumed in the classic papers uh, for calculating these covariances. And the corrections that have been made for uh, the peculiar velocities in, for example, the joint light curve analysis do not correlate with the direct measurements that were made, for example, in the CA3 survey. And uh, I refer you to this paper, uh, which has been submitted to monthly notices for more details. But let me now uh, come to the actual analysis you have done. And uh, I hope you'll forgive me if I go a bit faster now because uh, uh, this is actually older work. This started in 2016 uh, when we uh, uh, looked at the then public JLA catalog, which is shown here. Uh, it has about half the sample is at uh, very close to us, the red ones. And uh, the purple things are from the Hubble Space Telescope for which of course you have to go out into space because they are so red shifted there in the infrared. And in between is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the uh, SNLS survey. And they contribute about uh, total 740 supernovae, about three quarters are within this bulk flow that I uh, talked about earlier. The second thing that we uh, do, apart from improving on the uh, corrections for peculiar velocities, is that we do a principal statistical analysis. What does that mean? I'll tell you in a second. First, a very quick reminder that we are looking at uh, type 1a supernovae, which are identified uh, spectrally to be thermonuclear, uh, i.e. not core collapse, but nobody really knows how they form. There are various possible uh, candidate origins, and indeed the scatter in the light curves, which are measured in various bands. So this is the astronomical jargon that one has to learn, uh, the PV, etc. bands. The, the light curves are uh, quite diverse, even for type 1a supernovae, although in all cases you can see the nickel 56 uh, radioactive decay at large times. But the real revolution in astronomy occurred because we can see the rise of the light curve. And this is only possible because of the use of CCD cameras that can survey the sky night after night. So you can go back to a patch of sky where a supernova went off and you can measure the rise of the light curve, which is crucial for determining the width of the light curve. And that turns out to be important because this huge scatter in the uh, light curve uh, can be reduced, as Phillips pointed out, uh, by using a empirical anticorrelation between the peak magnitude and the width of the light curve. And that is slightly different in different maps. So you can also use it as a, a corrector for the reddening due to dust along the line of sight. And although you don't understand this correlation theoretically, it's very hard to model a type 1 supernova, you can use it to reduce the scatter and make them into uh, standardizable candles that uh, you can use for cosmology. So what you actually measure is the peak magnitude, and you also measured uh, these uh, stretch and color corrections, which are necessary to put all the supernova light curves onto the same curve. And this template, uh, uh, what we are using currently is called the spectral adaptive light curve template version two, uh, 
uh, this is a great advance because people were earlier using different templates and now uh, all the data have been reduced using the same template. So you can make a apples for apples comparison. So when you do this, uh, you can uh, uh, get these numbers for all of the 740 supernovae. And uh, if you are the JLA collaboration, you're nice enough to publish them publicly so that all of us can access the data. They also show, for example, other parameters like the mass of the host galaxy, which might be relevant. And maybe there are other things that are relevant. But in fact, we'll stick to uh, just the stretch and color corrections, which are, uh, you know, the, there is no correlation between them. They were good choices for the standardization. And the cosmology is straightforward. We are using so far the standard FLRW cosmology, where you have a luminosity distance that is given in terms of the cosmological parameters, uh, omega k, omega lambda, omega matter, etc. And uh, you can relate that to the observed magnitude and redshift. In fact, we don't even need to use uh, the standard cosmological model because uh, we are looking at acceleration, which is a kinematic quantity. So you can just do a Taylor expansion, the classic uh, uh, expansion in terms of the first term being the Hubble expansion, next term being the uh, deceleration, as it was then thought it might be, uh, and then the jerk and so on. We stick to three terms. Um, and then comes this issue of how to construct the likelihood. Well, the likelihood is the probability of uh, seeing the data given a model. And you can safely make the assumption that you can factorize it into something that depends on the cosmology and something that depends on the supernovae, because the two don't know about each other. So in other words, you can say that what we observe is drawn from some underlying population. And that underlying population uh, is, has got distributions which you need to know in order to calculate this likelihood. So my then student, uh, Jeppe Nielsen uh, at uh, Copenhagen, along with Alberto Gufanti, uh, uh, who we uh, worked with uh, us on this, uh, noticed that these corrections as published by JLA are actually pretty well fitted by Gaussians. So if you assume that the underlying distributions are also Gaussian, then I can trivially integrate that likelihood and this is the likelihood that has also been used in uh, Bayesian uh, calculations by Roberto Trotta and uh, collaborators. It is uh, uh, now the standard likelihood used in these calculations. And uh, once you have the likelihood, you can calculate uh, the confidence regions, you can calculate uh, uh, the confidence contours, et cetera. What I want to point out is that previous papers in the supernova cosmology field had done something quite different. They had constructed a chi-square, which is the difference between the observed magnitude and uh, the theoretical one, and divided it by the uncertainty square. This is perfectly valid. But then they had added to every data point a so-called intrinsic uncertainty, which they then adjusted to get a good fit to the assumed model, which is lambda CDM. So I repeat again, they actually fitted to the assumed model. This is okay if you want to determine parameters once you are sure that your model is correct, but this is not uh, the principal way to do things when you don't know what your model is. What we are proposing to do is uh, therefore rather different. And that is why when we did analyze the same data in the omega lambda omega matter plane, our contours were not the same as had been found earlier. These were, in fact, much closer to the line separating acceleration from no acceleration. And the evidence for acceleration, therefore, was much, much smaller. So we have a 10-parameter model. Our best fit still has got omega lambda and omega matter, but it just shows that the statistical analysis done earlier uh, was not appropriate. Now, we showed the answer in this plane simply for comparison with the previous results. Uh, but of course, then a lot of people uh, <laughs> told us that, oh, didn't you know that there is a lower bound on omega matter and then they have to sit on this diagonal line because the curvature is zero. So you can't be anywhere near here. You must be around here. Uh, well, I think we did know that. But the point is that this is just one model. Uh, acceleration is, as I said, a kinematic quantity and you can examine it independent of a model, right? And these constraints are only relevant to the three-parameter lambda CDM model. In more general models, 
there might be other terms in the hubble equation so we will not have such a simple sum rule and these constraints will not be relevant now our work was criticized by uh, rubin and hayden who said we took the stretch and corrections to be independent of redshift they're plotted here but they say look if you look carefully you can uh, see that there could be trends with the redshift in the stretch and color corrections uh, not in the hst data the errors are too large but in the rest of it right so they add 12 parameters to the 10 parameter model we had to try to describe this and by doing so they actually do manage to lift this uh, uh, contour a bit higher so the evidence for acceleration goes up from 2.8 sigma to 3.7 sigma right uh now we don't believe this is justified because you know if you add enough parameters you can of course fit anything as is well known and in particular uh, if you apply the bayesian information criterion then this is not justified as we pointed out later now i come to the new analysis we did which took the same data set which by now we had got to understand pretty well and we looked at the peculiar velocity corrections that had been made to it and this is work done with colin uh, jack colin and roya mohai and mohammad ramiz and ramiz did a very uh, clever piece of analysis in which he undid the corrections that they had made for the peculiar velocities of the supernova host galaxies and established that these people had used a peculiar flow model which is basically unphysical because the peculiar velocity correction stopped dead at about 150 mega parsecs right although we actually observed the peculiar velocities to continue to 300 mega parsecs right and this is unphysical because you can't have a flow stop dead at a certain point so what we did was we undid the corrections to get at the raw data so the distribution of the supernova is shown here this is the uh, cmb dipole these are the directions of the bulk flows from the uh, smack Uh, collaboration and the 2m plus plus collaboration and when we did this if you allow for the acceleration or deceleration parameter whatever you like to call it to have a dipole we find that actually the maximum likelihood estimator picks it out to be a dipole uh, mainly a dipole right the monopole is now consistent with zero at just 1.4 sigma okay so this scale observe is uh, compressed hugely compared to this scale if i actually plotted them in proportion the vertical scale would go completely out of this picture and the standard model of cosmology is up here it is excluded at more than 4 sigma so this suggests to us that because it fits with the expectation uh, that christo sagas uh, had already uh, uh, specified that you should see a dipole in the acceleration along the direction of our motion through the cmb and that does indeed seem to be the case our data is actually too sparse to determine the direction but uh, if you actually look at the distribution of the likelihood the difference between the maximum that we find and the cmb the difference in uh, two log likelihood is only about 3 so uh, you know they are consistent between the two directions okay now when we published this the criticism that was made uh, was that we had should that our data was not the latest one we should look at the subsequent catalog that had had supernovae from pan stars and other things added to it unfortunately we can't do that because the individual contributions to the covariance especially the peculiar velocity corrections are not public and also uh, we are not quite sure about the redshift values because you can see for example in this public data table uh, they are clearly the same number under the cmb redshift and the heliocentric redshift and this has not been corrected although this has been around for now the last couple of years and uh, there have been other proposals uh, other projects other observations by the carnegie supernova project and the dark energy survey but again that data is not publicly available in the nice form that jla has made it available so that the rest of us can also use it would be very happy to use the data if it is made publicly available now let me come to uh, the last 5 minutes to the criticism of our work which is again by rubin and heitluf and they say that we have not allowed for redshift dependence of the light curve parameters uh, 
as, as I've already explained, uh, that is uh, not a valid argument because it violates the Bayesian criterion. And in fact, it opens a, you know, a Pandora's box. If you argue that uh, light curve parameters vary with redshift, then why not the intrinsic luminosity? So you might as well give up on supernovae. Then they say uh, we use heliocentric redshifts. Actually, this was done by all the supernovae analysis till 2011, including by the discovery papers in 1998 uh, by Perlmutter et al. and Ries et al. Uh, then they say we don't use data from the Southern Sky Surveys. I've just explained that they are not uh, available in a form we can use. And uh, then they make a technical complaint, which is not correct. So what they actually do, which is very helpful, is that they visually show that they do recover our result. Uh, and our result is this pink thing here. Okay, And uh, what they say is that they actually recovered the fact that you see a large dipole and a very small monopole. The, uh, you know, the standard model is around here. Uh, if we if they follow the procedure that we do, but then uh, this, so there are two ways to do it without or with including the covariances. This is a technical point, so uh, don't ask me about it later. But uh, what you find, and then they show that in order to get to the correct answer, you have to first allow for this uh, redshift dependence of the light curve parameters that will move this to here. Then you have to go to CMB redshift that will move up to here. And then you have to correct for the peculiar velocity way, and then you will come down to that uh, gray region. So all these corrections need to be done in order to recover the accelerating universe at the level of significance that I already mentioned, something like 3.7 sig. More recently, there has been a, a new development, which is that uh, uh, Constant, uh, Constantinos Miggas and collaborators have been looking at X-ray clusters and uh, their redshift distribution is actually not dissimilar to the supernovae. Most of them are actually pretty local. And uh, the luminosity distribution uh, is shown here. So you can see how good they are at standard candles. And they also see an anisotropy in this, well, in roughly the same direction. It's actually 23 degrees off from uh, the direction I mentioned earlier. Now, I have come to the end of my talk, but I do want to mention an important uh, point as to why we do not do the transformation to the CMB frame, which is the standard workhorse of the field. And if I may, therefore, just take five more minutes from work, uh, with your indulgence. This is to show something that uh, people may not be aware of, which is that whereas the theory of uh, why we see a dipole in the CMB is well known, what is less well known is that, of course, we should see a similar dipole in every other cosmologically distant population of sources. And this was computed by George Ellis and Baldwin uh, in Cambridge some years ago. You see the aberration that was uh, first pointed out by Bradley uh, 200 years earlier. And you also see Doppler boosting. So when you put it all that in, you should see a dipole in other distant sources like radio sources. And this is the radio catalog from uh, VLA. And uh, that only, of course, uh, covers uh, the northern sky. And uh, that has got uh, you know, nearly 2 million sources. But we have supplemented it with a catalog from the southern sky, from Molonglo, at a slightly different frequency. So we have to do the correction for the different Doppler shifting. But we can get them to match to within 1% by doing that. And therefore, we have a full sky catalog and we can remove possible sources of contamination by objects close to us, uh, like in the galactic plane or the supergalactic plane, which might give you an, uh, you know, a spurious dipole uh, because of their proximity. And uh, we are therefore certain that what we are looking at is distant. And we do see a clear dipole in this distribution, as you see here. The problem is only that although the direction is close to the CMB, the velocity is about four times bigger than the CMB. And this was actually first pointed out by Ashok Singhal uh, some years, nine years ago. And then uh, various people criticized him for uh, you know, having used a map that was not full sky, not having addressed the possibility of local contaminants and all that. We have addressed all those concerns, but the anomaly that Singhal first pointed out is there. And very recently, uh, perhaps in next week, we'll be putting out a paper where we confirm this using quasars from the all-wise catalog about a million objects. 
and the significance is close to four sig. So I'll skip this because uh, people may ask me about what about the evidence for acceleration from other probes, but I think other people have shown that uh, all the current data is consistent with no acceleration. And the CMB data, as you know, that don't directly give evidence for lambda. We infer that in the context of the sum rule that I've already told you. So the conclusions are as follows, that there is a dipole in the recession velocities of the galaxies that host supernovae. And uh, we can infer that you are in a bulk flow that is stretching out at least to 300 megaparsecs, which is well beyond the scale of around 100 megaparsecs at which the universe is meant to become homogeneous. We infer that the Hubble expansion rate uh, is not really accelerating because it is a dipole, the acceleration parameter. And so it is clearly correlated with the local bulk flow. And any monopole component is consistent with zero. And if you are going to interpret that as a cosmological constant and vacuum energy, then it better be isotropic. So this is of great significance to all the people who worry about the string landscape and swampland and so on. Now, of course, this opens up lots of new avenues. What is causing this bulk flow? It could be due to new horizon scale physics, maybe a horizon scale lasso curvature perturbation. Uh, Mike Turner had uh, written a paper about that years ago. But if it turns out that the CMB dipole is not of kinematic origin, as we are finding by looking at other distant sources, then how do we understand it? Be that as it may, I hope to have convinced you that at least it's worth looking at this so-called standard assumptions of isotropy and homogeneity. And the good news is, of course, that there is a lot of excellent data uh, coming our way from Euclid, from LSST, from uh, Square Kilometer Array. And therefore, uh, the question of whether the universe is actually dominated by dark energy will be resolved. And I would only add as a personal comment that I find this to be far, far more interesting to do than pursuing so-called precision cosmology of an unphysical toy model that has not essentially changed for a hundred years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Subir. Yes. Very interesting talk. Shomak had to uh, go uh, for another meeting. Mm. So kind of I've taken over. Okay. Uh, and just to tell people that if they have a question, please raise your hand in the Zoom. Yeah, I can see already many hands which are raised, and I will unmute you so that you can ask your questions. Thanks. I think Tarun. Uh, yes, you can. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Yes. Hi, uh, Subir. Nice talk. Uh, so I just wanted to go into your last slide. You know, you mentioned about uh, then, you know, the dipole need not be kinematic. Yes. I wanted to know your opinion about the fact that we do see the dipole also as correlations in the CMB fluctuations, right? I mean, you can look at it like a uh, isotropy violation term, and you recover the dipole, not of course uh, with great accuracy, but fairly robustly. So yes, that's a good point. Sure, I completely agree that uh, this, uh, I'm familiar with the Planck paper nicely titled Le Pussy Move. Mm. And the uh, issue is simply that, uh, indeed, if the dipole is of kinematic origin, you should see these correlations in the higher multiples, and they were looked for. But in fact, the significance of the finding is not very high. And uh, although it was uh, accepted as having confirmed the dipole nature. I think it would be good to have a uh, more uh, significant uh, result. And I know, for example, that your ex-student Shubhadi Mukherjee and others are actually uh, trying to reanalyze the data in order to see if they can raise the significance to a level where that would indeed be an independent confirmation. But you're absolutely right. That is the right way to go about it using the CAP. Okay, thanks. Uh, Shantanu, I have unmuted. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Shantanu Desai. Okay, can you hear me? 
Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you, Subir. A very nice talk. I always learn something new uh, every time I uh, listen to this talk. So I, I guess a, a couple of questions. So one is very basic. So I, I guess uh, when astronomers measure redshifts, like, are they using spectroscopy or photometry? Do they measure? Do they measure the CMB or the heliocentric redshift? I mean, this no subtle differences was not obvious un, un, until I sort of came across your work. My second question is, I mean, can you actually probe this uh, dipole nature of the acceleration using whatever stage four dark energy experiments like W first and this thing more stringently using other probes besides supernova? Thank you. Shubhi, are you there? Oh, Shubhi, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, very sorry about that. Um, I said, since we are uh, unfortunately localized on the Earth or around it, we always, by definition, measure the heliocentric redshift uh, after, of course, correcting for the Earth's motion around the Sun. Uh, we The CMB uh, frame redshift is a notional redshift. It is not something that actually is directly measured. You have a model in which you can, uh, uh, you know, boost to that frame by making a special relativistic transformation, as I explained. So whether that frame exists or not is the question. And in fact, one could argue, as a general relativist, that uh, given that you know space has differential expansion, uh, David Wilshire and colleagues have argued does that you cannot actually um, uh, explain uh, well account with just a special relativistic transformation for what needs to be done. Right. Uh, there's a question by uh, Mukesh Vyas. Yes. Can, can, can you ask him? Hello. Can, can, ask can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask, uh, apart from the dipole, there are multiples, uh, well-structured multiples also existing in the CMB. Any comment on their existence in the uh, explanation? Well, uh, Tarun Saradev already asked uh, yeah. the, that uh, it, there should be correlations because of this uh, aberration effect, which was uh, calculated long time ago and has been looked for in the Planck data. Uh, unfortunately, the significance of the detection is rather marginal. With regard to uh, multiples in the uh, deceleration parameter, Unfortunately, with only 740 objects, we cannot afford to do a, a you know, go to higher multiples. Than that. Yeah, thanks. Any you other just need more data. If you had a million redshifts, then we can do it. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Shubir? I don't see raised hands yet. Sorry, Kandu, um, I can't raise my hand as a yes, Please, go ahead, go ahead. You are a co-host. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, so, Subir, uh, thanks for this nice talk. I just wanted to give a couple of comments. One is uh, that uh, the Pantheon sample, you mentioned that the CMB and the heliocentric redshifts are different. Um, I, uh, or they were the same on the website. Uh, I have located the file where um, both of them are different, so I will send out the link to you. That's yes, uh, thank uh, you. Yeah, and then uh, the second thing is uh, I wanted to ask, uh, so uh, is are you trying to say that maybe we are living in some kind of a void or something which is causing these flows and, and this kind of a dipole? And well, uh, whether yeah, there on. are things related to the kinetic as the effect which you could use in order to probe these. Uh, sure. Uh, well, that question is particularly relevant in the light of, uh, in fact, this recent finding of a possible anisotropy uh, in the X-ray clusters, where uh, indeed that would be particularly relevant. Now, uh, I have refrained from any uh, attempt to interpret what we are seeing. Sure, the local void idea is an interesting one and has come up in many different contexts. In fact, uh, we have even worked on it, uh, modeling it as a lemeth tolman bondi model and so on. And then this issue, as you mentioned, of the kinematic uh, sunav zeldovich effect does come up. However, that is only going to constrain uh, uh, something which is uh, above a gig gigaparsec. Okay? You are not going to get a strong constraint on scales. Uh, you see here the redshift distribution of these objects 
is actually, most of them are within a redshift of 0.1, within a few hundred megaparsecs. You're not going to get a strong constraint from the KZ effect there. However, Miggas believes that maybe by stacking clusters, he might be able to get a signal. So he's looking into it. They are also very interested in the connection between the bulk flow, which is established, uh, the anisotropies that are cropping up in all these traces, and the local geometry, which of course might be horribly complicated. I mean, I remind you that the detailed mapping of our neighborhood uh, actually leads to a picture such as this. And uh, ideally, we have to do a model which is a little better than just an empty void with us being a slightly off center. So the problem is it becomes mathematically very complicated, as you know. So if you go to a, a arbitrary, inhomogeneous and anisotropic model, uh, the, you know, like, then it, uh, the number of parameters increases to the point where you can't really engage with the current data set. Hopefully, with the larger data sets that are coming our way, uh, that would be possible to do. Thanks. Okay, there's a question by, I don't know who it is, but it says Baba's iPhone. Can you unmute yourself? This is actually Patrick Dasgupta. Hi, Baba's Patrick. IPhone is Patrick. Ah, okay. So, great talk, Subir, as usual. Uh, so, I have just one naive question. Since the bulk flow, they are all sort of pointing roughly towards one direction, uh, and you don't see any uh, supercluster in that direction. Could it be due to supercluster size, uh, dark matter bound system, uh, which is under dense, which is essentially baryon matter under dense? It's, of course, a purely speculative picture that I'm uh, portraying. Yeah, I understand. Uh, well, as, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, this supernova factory people already interpreted their data in terms of a attractor, uh, simply to illustrate how extreme such an object, I think, has to be. And obviously, the attractor mass grows the further away it is. And we are already got uh, by the, to the point that we have explored so far, which is about 300 megaparsecs. You're up to 10 to the 17 solar masses, which is roughly the mass of the Lanakia supercluster that we are embedded in. Now, whether there is a object like that out there or not is, of course, a matter for speculation. Uh, Spiti Somok had to live. He's uh, done a lot of work on looking for the original great attractor, which was actually supposed to be much closer to us, but has never been really found. I mean, that, is, that was, of course, just a generic term coin for whatever it is that is pulling us. And uh, yes, it could be a huge lump of dark matter. But then, Patrick, the question arises, in the standard lambda CDA model, we do have a good uh, uh, foundation for understanding the distribution of dark matter clumps of various masses. And uh, the question can then be turned into a different one. What are the odds of finding such a huge mass so close to us? So that comes back to what I was saying earlier as being a, uh, us being non copernican observers. It's the same point uh, seen from a different angle. Right, right. So a, a maximum likelihood test would be required to check what is the probability that such a bizarre uh, dark matter cloud can be there. Probably well, the problem. For a start, you need a lot more data. I mean, we are talking uh, so far about of order a thousand supernovae. Uh, so that's not enough to do the kind of uh, analysis that you are asking for. We would have to wait for uh, numbers which, if not uh, 50 times bigger. Right. Thanks, Subir. Thanks. So, uh, Dr. Nesselsky, I have unmuted you. Can you please ask your question? Okay. Uh, hi, Subir. I would hi, like to. Hi. I would like to continue our very sharp discussion in Copenhagen. Yes. And I, I'm wondering to ask two questions in regards to your beautiful presentation. My first question is, can you go back to the slide uh, for theory of velocity field? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's a beautiful, actually, um, slide. As you can see, 
and in all these description as velocity field as delta field mm -hmm. they are assumed to be a gaussian and small in amplitude right, right? below 100 megaparsec velocity is still small yes but the density field is actually start to feel uh, to fill out now some non-linearity condition okay yeah. and definitely extrapolation of the uh, this linear theory to even to 100 megaparsecs needs some modification modification would be related to the actually distribution function of the velocity because I see your point. Yes, to uh, understand velocity so, voted according to the log log no, long, uh, log, log novel, novel. Yeah, log novel distribution. Not, no, uh, I, uh, yeah, it will change you actually. You know, probability and likelihood yes. dramatically. That, that that's a that's a very important point. So for uh, people in the audience who are not experts on this, the point is that I sort of glossed over it. But of course, all, all through here we are assuming Gaussian random fluctuations and uh, Professor Nasevsky makes the point that that need not be so and if so our expectations for the peculiar velocity and indeed the density contrast which is going nonlinear on small scales would be altered. Now the belief Pavel is that this is not going to affect what is going to happen at uh, scales of the order of 300 megaparsecs by which time surely you are in the linear regime. Now, you might be right that that is uh, too uh, quick a conclusion that what it is worth looking, I think, at the effects that you're talking about. And indeed, um, we are right now engaged in a, a new program with uh, Roya and others on a reconstruction uh, program, as you know, which is numerically very, very challenging, but some new tools have been developed to tackle that, whether we can, in fact, um, uh, address that you're talking about uh, uh, without having to simply assume Gaussianity for the sake of simplicity mm -hmm. of our equations. That's and, a good point. Okay, can I ask my last, que my last question? So, Beer, you know what? I'm old fashioned, actually, a scientist. If the first correction in IPAL modulation yes. has some amplitude significantly greater than monopole, yes. I would immediately check the next term which is quadrupole modulation. Got it. So and you're talking about the, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, go on. I would like to understand whether or not there is some convergence in terms of the, you know, some theory of perturbations. Could it be that the other terms are uh, significant at the same level as the dipole? Yeah, well, uh, the point is that, of course, what I'm using is the matic expansion, which goes back to, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, hundred, you know, nearly a hundred years. Uh, this was devised at a time when objects were only known at uh, low redshift. This whole expansion starts breaking down when you get to high redshift. Uh, up to the scale that you have got so far, it is still okay because uh, there is only a six percent difference between the exact distance and the one that is calculated according to this expansion. But even so. Uh, this is only useful for looking at uh, redshift, you know, objects within redshift of one. So, to uh, where these higher order corrections are not that important. So, we have a, a situation where we don't have enough data if you go to high redshift and the approximation itself breaks down. And then you would need to have a better expansion parameters. And in fact, Matt Visser uh, has suggested a different expansion parameter that holds out to larger redshift, uh, uh, and uh, maybe you could use that. But really what we need, Pavel, is more data. I mean, with 740 supernovae, there's only so much you can do. So yeah. if you want to ask uh, that question, uh, or rather have it answered, uh, uh, then you do need to increase the number of objects. So I'm very much uh, supportive of all these new missions that are uh, promising to increase the number of supernovae. For example, the new Vera Rubin telescope will still conduct the LSST survey. A very clever piece of renaming uh, is a survey of space and time. That's what it is now called. And that uh, will pretty get us uh, ideally, you know, 10,000 supernovae within a few years. And then we'll be in business. Okay, thanks. Swagat, you had a question? Uh, hi, Kandu. I am hi. asking this question on behalf of uh, Professor Varun Sani. Okay. Uh, 
so uh, he has two questions. The first question is, uh, uh, we know that the standard cold duct matter cannot generate very large scale bulk flows. So which would be your favorite theoretical option to do it? Uh, as you know, uh, in order to generate large scale bulk flows, uh, one needs more power in the power spectrum. But power spectrum is very well known from uh, at small scales from SDSS and at large scales from CMB. So the only way out would be to have some kind of a new ingredient uh, to create uh, gravitational instability like strings or something like that. So what would be your view is the first question. Uh, that's a very interesting question. So it of course came up a bit earlier when I think Surud asked about the void. That's uh, that was a favorite model for uh, looking for uh, local flows which are not uh, expected in the standard theory. Now, before we uh, so the first I think the okay let me step back one. The first thing is to understand using uh, simulations Hubble volume simulations of the standard lambda CDA model, what is really our uh, situation as observers? So as I mentioned, it seems to be the standard assumption made in most cosmological analysis that we are typical observers. And what we actually find is that if we take into account the bulk flow that we observe, that means that we are not typical observers. We are very unusual observers. We are at the very tail end of what might be expected uh, in the real universe, you know, the, or rather the simulated universe. So this directly impacts on analysis of data because it determines the covariances that are used in the data analysis. So I think my first answer to Varun would be that I think one needs to revisit some of the uh, received wisdom about uh, Lambda CDN in the light of this keeping in mind this kind of almost philosophical shift that we are not really typical observers, we are very unusual observers. Right? The next question is, why are you unusual? Why is there this large bulk flow? You know, is there something very exotic hanging around just over the horizon pulling us? Uh, is there a cosmic string or whatever you mentioned? Now that uh, is of course a, a very interesting question uh, and it's also very, very speculative. Today, we don't have the tools to even address that question. We need to firm up this peculiar velocity data because currently it is in fact uh, rather sparse. I've shown you the state of the art of this data and people argue about even this data and the way to calculate the uncertainties. We do have upper limits on the bulk flow at much larger scales. Uh, this is the kinetics and I have delta V effect that was mentioned earlier on which Planck has set uh, constraints on large scales. But uh, you can't, uh, you know, we are talking about a few hundred megaparsecs up to here. And uh, it is not clear that uh, you can, in fact, do, uh, you can use CMB at all in order to constrain uh, scales uh, uh, on, on, of, of this order. So uh, I think that the way forward would be uh, to wait for the data from the upcoming surveys, LSST and SK in particular, in order to better understand uh, the local bulk flow and see how far out it does go, because it has got to the point where it is and uh, a kind of uh, very hard to understand in terms of standard physics, for example, in terms of a great attractor, but it is not impossible, right? At the point where it becomes impossible, to understand it in terms of uh, lambda CDM, then I would be, uh, you know, uh, very interested in looking at the possibilities that uh, Varun uh, is mentioning. Thank you. And and the second question is, uh, this is from your paper. Mm -hmm. uh, from the figure four of your paper, the value yes. of monopole QM is yes. close to zero, yes. which rules out both uh, deceleration and acceleration at the same le confidence level. So, so would you prefer that your cosmological model will be a coasting cosmology with uh, uh, linear dependence on time, scale factor? Yeah, well, that was actually what was hinted at in our previous analysis that uh, our universe was close to a coasting cosmology. And in fact, uh, a further uh, a look at the data by uh, uh, Alain Blanchard and collaborators, I'm trying to find the slide, who looked at a number of other uh, pieces of data like baron acoustic oscillations, uh, the you know uh, cosmic chronometers, uh, 
or the uh, sigma eight inferred from various probes, they concluded that actually the best fit to all the data is a model where A goes as T to the 0.92. So in other words, very close to a coasting cosmology. Uh, we actually had called it a Milne model earlier because Milne had considered uh, you know, a model where A goes as T. Of course, that was a kinematic cosmology, uh, but uh, and I, we only use the term in order to kind of honor uh, Edward Milne, who happened to be a professor of geometry at Oxford. But unfortunately, that was misinterpreted and people thought we are really talking about an empty universe. Uh, as you know, uh, it doesn't have to be an empty universe. You can have the same A goes as T if you just have the active amount of matter close to zero. Uh, so for example, P plus three row um, uh, close to zero would do that. But the work that I'm now talking about, so that is indicated here. If P plus three row goes to zero, then you have an uniform rate of expansion, right? That we all know. But what I'm actually pointing out now is that the real situation might be quite different from all of that because, in fact, we are not actually observers, uh, you know, Copernican observers in an isotropic homogeneous universe. If you are, in fact, tilted observers uh, in a bulk flow, then the analysis of all data should be done taking into account the very fact that we are not uh, the idealized observer that is usually assumed in cosmological analysis. So the interpretation of what the scale, how the scale factor changes uh, would also have to be revisited because what this is saying is that uh, this, you know, uh, uh, this uh, formulation of A going as T or T to the 0.92 or whatever, um, that this is still referring to an isotropic homogeneous model and the real universe uh, may have a strong anisotropy, in which case we have to revisit that question. Thank you, Professor Sir. Thank you. So, there seems to be one more urgent question, probably the, let's say the last by Shantanu Desan. Okay. Can you please unmute and ask your question? Shantanu? Yeah, so uh, again, uh, let me just re-ask, and I think you partially answered it. So I guess with uh, stage four dark energy missions like Euclid, W1, Vera Rubin, how well can you pin down this dipole acceleration? I, I, dipole term, I don't think so. I've seen uh, official forecast from, this, from the surveys itself, but... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, well, that is exactly what I complained about, that uh, uh, the, all the yellow books and blue books for all these amazing experiments uh, go on about finding the next decimal point in the equation of state of dark energy, but very simple, uh, obvious tests are not discussed in any detail. But it's obvious that if uh, you know the LSST is going to find 10,000 supernovae, then they, they can do a lot better than we have done using just 740. And uh, the uh, you well SK again will have uh, many many more radio sources than the ones that I discussed in uh, the dipole that we are finding in the distribution of the NVSS catalog, right? So those are obvious tests to do. And uh, SKA people have in fact uh, released now a, a paper concerning fundamental physics. Uh, Dominic Schwartz and uh, others have pointed out that this anomaly uh, really needs to be sorted out. It has been now around for uh, over nine years. And it has been now, as you said, confirmed uh, using a new catalog of quasars, which, have their, which are definitely at high redshift there is no contamination from low redshift objects at all. I hope to uh, have this. We hope to have this paper out uh, next week. And uh, if this anomaly uh, is confirmed, I mean, the point being that we are still limited by the number of sources we have. It's about of order a million, so it's still around you know 3.6, 3.7 sigma. Uh, if we want to make it up to five sigma, as is necessary if you want to claim a discovery of fundamental importance, then you would need obviously 10, 100 million sources and for that SK would be necessary. But okay. these are, I, I repeat, these are very simple tests. You can do them for a master's project. Uh, you know, they're, they're not very sophisticated. Sorry. Right. Uh, okay, great. I think there are no further questions. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Shubhi. That has been a wonderful talk. Very interesting, somewhat provocative, but that's how it should be. And thank you very much to all the audience. It reached about 130 plus in the Zoom. Wow. Uh, and thanks a lot to everybody. For can attending. I just ask, uh, did you say there would be some questions on the, uh, what is it YouTube. called, YouTube feed? Ah, Surud, there's the questions on the YouTube. Uh, yeah, so I was uh, looking at the YouTube questions, but I think um, no, there are none which are that great. So okay, okay, fine. I'll look on it later. Thank you very much for having Thanks, me. Sir. I really appreciate it. Yes, it was.